Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Christoph Koch. He is the professor of biology and engineering at Caltech and the chief scientific officer of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. He earned his PhD in biophysics at the University of Tübingen in Germany in 1982. He investigates the biophysics of nerve cells with focus on the neuronal and computational basis of visual perception and attention. And he has also pioneered the scientific study of consciousness. He's the author of more than 350 scientific journal articles, and he holds seven patents. As an author, he's also written several books, the latest, or the next of which, is called Consciousness, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist. The book will treat the philosophical, religious, scientific, and personal questions related to his research. Today, he will summarize what is known about the neurobiology of consciousness, describe ongoing experiments in the field, and outline the limits to our knowledge and the difficulty that we face in trying to construct sentient machines. Please welcome Dr. Christoph Koch. Great. Thank you. All right, wow. So usually it, um, when, when you talk as an academic about consciousness, you're regaled to the uh, back end of the program. But um, uh, today I feel completely grounded um, compared to talk about immortality. So I'm not going to talk about immortality or downloading our minds and being able to model the entire human brain. One dirty secret that's a little appreciated, the best understood organisms, bar none, is a little worm called C. elegans, the round worm. The round worm has 968 cells, of which one third, 302, are nerve cells. So it's a creature that has been around for several hundred million years, has 302 cells and neurons. We have its complete wiring diagram, and we have no understanding whatsoever at the system level how, how this uh, creature works. There's no general purpose program. There's, there, um, there are individual models to model a small subset of it, the larynx, the anus, and other parts, sort of 10 or 20 neurons. There's no general program that has any understanding uh, of the worm as a whole system, and that's only three or two neurons. So just as a, as a, as a cautionary tale. So um, I, I'm going to talk about consciousness. What I mean by consciousness is not a higher form of consciousness, some vibrational state, but it's something very concrete. In fact, the only thing we know of, the only reality we know of, because it's what we experience. It is experience, after all. It's the pain and pleasures of life, the sounds and the sights of life. You can see that's a simple visual illusion that people use in the lab. Could I have the first slide? So if you fix it, if you keep your eyes very steady here on this cross here at the bottom, you should see something. Otherwise, you should come see me afterwards if you don't. <laughs> now, what you should see, you should all see a ball of, a sphere of blue swirling dots, right? Yes? Hello? Yes. All right. Now, if you keep your eyes steady, what, what, you should see something else. Yeah, so do you see that? Yeah. One or both of those yellow squares will disappear. It's called motion use blindness. We don't fully understand why it happens, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting illusion. And you can, it's not, I mean, trust me, I'm, I'm a scientist. I don't, I, don't mem I don't mess here with the input. The, the, yellow, the yellow squares are there all the time. In fact, you can talk to your neighbor, and the time when they disappear for you is going to be different when they disappear for her. And the point about it, sometimes you see the yellow squares, and sometimes you do not. When you do not see them, you have no yellow square experience. They're just not there. You remember them. But, but you don't directly experience them. When you see them, they remind you of yellow, they remind you of the uh, you know, yellow Van Gogh um, and other things. And where's the, the, the question that Francis Crick and I first set out to answer 25 years ago is a very simple one. Where's the difference in your brain between when you're conscious of yellow and when you're not conscious of yellow? And the claim is that this is a natural phenomena. It's a phenomena of, of somehow you know, space and time and complex matter, although we don't, we don't understand right, uh, right now how it happens, but it's a natural phenomena. And once you understand this simple form of visual consciousness, we are very likely on the road to discovering all forms of consciousness, including those that are held more dear, more dear by intellectuals who tend to write the books, namely self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is sort of, it's just one particular highly developed form of consciousness that we have. Other, other mammals have it much less. I mean, great apes have it, dolphins have it to a certain extent, but my dog, for example, doesn't sit there and worry, oh, I'm a dog and my, my, my tail has a funny wag. Uh, that's not inherent in, in, uh, in dog nature, but there's no question to me that the dog, by any other definition, is, um, is, is conscious. And in fact, its brain is very similar to, to our brain. 
Right, so at this point, one has to make a conceptual distinction between two usage of the words consciousness. There's content of consciousness and there's states of consciousness. So content of consciousness is what I talk about, the yellow square. It's what philosophers refer to as qualia. So the elements making up any one conscious sensation is qualia. There's qualia for pain, for pleasure, for, for orgasmic feeling, whatever. And that's primarily the content provider of our brain is cortex and the, and the thalamus, the corticothalamic system. But then we need something to enable those different states of, um, those the, the, to enable the different content, and those are the states of consciousness. So right now, I hope I haven't put anybody to sleep yet, because sleep is a different um, state of consciousness. <laughs> when you are in, um, in non-REM, in deep sleep, or when you are in REM, it's a different form of, of um, uh, it's a different state of consciousness in which you're conscious, but albeit it's dream consciousness, it has, a, it's a, it has a different form, it has a peculiar flavor that makes it very different from awake consciousness. And of course these mechanisms, these so-called arousal mechanisms, can be profoundly disturbed in things like coma, when there's no consciousness, in things like a persistent vegetative state, PBS, you might remember, uh, six years ago, this lady, Terry Schiavo, as far as we can tell, she was alive for 14 years, but she, she was not conscious, although her eyes moved occasionally, she had reflexes, but she, she was in a so-called position veg uh, vegetative state. And there are roughly 20 to 30,000 of these patients in the U.S. alone. And then there are more minor, uh, there are things like minimal conscious state when you might be partially conscious, or they're locked in state in which you're fully conscious, uh, albeit you're unable to move. So, well, what's wrong in those, ca in, in those clinical, very relevant conditions is, is states of consciousness are profoundly disturbed, usually due to drug damage or uh, traumatic accidents or things of that nature. But the, the real, the, the, the difficult to understand how consciousness comes into the world is the content. What makes a, the, the unique experience you have when you, when you smell a flower? Uh, that's a particular experience, and it feels like something to smell a flower. How, how can a physical system consisting out of atoms, and you know, that follows all the laws of physics, including quantum mechanics and all the other stuff, how can it have an experience? There seems to be a, an explanatory gap, what the philosophers call a gap, between the physics of the brain and what your conscious experience is. And as scientists, we need to understand that. Now, there are many things that we know about consciousness uh, uh, that, that any theory of consciousness has to explain. So we know that consciousness is associated with certain complex systems, albeit not with all complex systems. For instance, your immune system. Right now, there are many people here, they come, we come from all over the planet, so there might be people who carry strange viruses with them, right? And so your immune system is busy fighting off those viruses, but you're utterly uh, unaware of that. Your immune system does its work silently, eliminating, for the most part, these, these, uh, these pathogens. Well, so an interesting question. It's a biological system. It has memory, because once you form an antibody, you remember them for the rest of your life. Why isn't it conscious? We don't know. There's another brain in your gut called the enteric nervous system, sometimes the second brain. is roughly half a billion neurons. Again, it doesn't seem to be, co it does lots of things down there in the plumbing, Right? But, but, but you, you don't really have conscious access to it. What, when you have a feeling of fullness, of nausea, it's a part up here called the insular cortex that generates this. Why is it not conscious? Or maybe it's conscious, but it's not telling me. We don't know right now. So, so, so there has to be something special about the central nervous system that makes it different from the enteric nervous system or from the immune system. We know that sleep, uh, conscious goes away during deep sleep. It happens every night. It's an interesting fact that we need to explain. Only in deep sleep, because in dream, in REM sleep, it seems to come back in a, in a, in a somewhat different form, but you're certainly conscious of your dreams. You, can, you have pain, you have pleasure, you can have intensely felt emotions. We know that consciousness doesn't require behavior. Once again, the, the, the thing that happens to all of us at night, we dream, we fly, we run, we make love, but we, we're paralyzed, right? Our brain has this atonia, this paralysis, because if we act out the dreams that some people do with parasomnias, you know, you can do great damage to yourself if you live on the t 50th floor, or you can hurt your, your bad partner if you're fighting, you know, if you're acting out a, a fight. And we know this from experimental animals where we can remove this paralysis, and then we see cats, for example, when they dream, they, they, dr they act out their dream, they sort of have these hunting and stalking behaviors. And we also just know from pathologies, cataplexy or other things, where you're fully conscious, but you're unable to move. So we know that, co that behavior is not required for, for consciousness. We know from patients, um, we know from kids that come back, uh, soldiers that come back from Afghanistan or um, Iraq with their limbs blown off, that where they have partly da damage to the prefrontal lobes, they can have totally flat affect. They can be totally, they don't care about the fact that their life has just changed fundamentally, they don't care about the fact that their limbs have been blown off because they've lost those parts of the brain that generates those emotions, yet they're fully conscious. They can tell you about their conscious experiences. So we know that emotions are necessary for normal, fully functioning, healthy life, but they're not essential for consciousness. 
We know that, again, from many, many patients, that you don't need episodic memory, you don't need long-term memory. Of course, you need it to survive, but, but you can just live, there are some patients that essentially, like a Greek tragedy, they only live in a sliver of time of five seconds. Anything that happened 10 or 20 seconds ago, they forget. Remember the movie Memento? That's actually a quite accurate portrayal of what happens in there. You're only conscious of this one sliver of time, but you're highly conscious of that. So you, um, you don't need these long-term memories. You, you, we don't need language and self-consciousness. I mean, this we know from people who can't talk anymore because they have strokes. We know this in babies and children who don't talk yet. Uh, we know this from all the animal uh, experiments that, that, that don't talk. You don't need language. You don't need self-consciousness. As, you know, as I mentioned before, if, you are, if you're running, you're climbing, you're going on a high-speed motorcycle through, through traffic, you're out all there. You're out there in the world. You're engaging with the world. You're not really conscious of yourself because you don't have time to say, here I am driving, driving on this motorcycle because then you're going to be dead. Or, you know, when you're watching a movie, when you're making love, in all these cases, you're out there in the world interacting with the, uh, with the world, but with very much reduced self-consciousness. So it's something that we cherish, particularly those of us who write books and think about ourselves, which doesn't necessarily make us happier, but, but it's not something that you need for, for consciousness. We know you don't need selective attention for consciousness. We know from split brain experiments done at Caltech by Roger Sperry many decades ago that even if you only have half of a brain, if you remove all of one cerebral hemisphere, either the left or the right one, you might not be able to talk if it's the left one, but you're, you're still conscious. So we know whatever the mechanism is, one cerebral hemisphere is sufficient to, to generate it. And the most interesting point of fact for theories of consciousness, it also has some very local aspect because consciousness has both holistic aspect but also has local aspect. So, for example, uh, in the city you have Oliver Sacks who's written very, very evocative about it. When you lose particular parts of your brain, you lose very specific content. You may, for example, be unable to recognize faces called posopagnosia or face blindness. You can see a face, but you, either in a very severe cases you don't know it's a face. You see the nose and the, the eyes and the uh, ears, but you're unable to put it together into percept of a face. Or you may uh, you have access you've lost access to the identity of the face. You can lose color vision. You can use um, um, motion vision. You live like in a in a stroboscope where you see people move like this, but you lost the sense of motion. So we know due to discrete la um, damage that you can lose very specific aspect of consciousness, which any theory of, of consciousness ha um, has to explain. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the strategy that most scientists, and this work is now done in hundreds of labs throughout the, throughout the world, are pursuing when they look for consciousness to do what's called, what uh, Francis Crick and I call the, uh, the, uh, the NCC, the Neural College of Consciousness. So, for instance, a standard experiment, you have a person look at blue, you put him in the magnet, and then you, you, you I'll show you an experiment, the, the next one, where you, where you do just what the magician does. You distract the patient or the subject, so the subject is still looking at blue, but it's not seeing blue anymore. And then you can study the difference in, a, in an MRI now, in the brain, where's the difference between seeing blue and not seeing blue. In both cases, you have the same input to your eye, but in one case, you're conscious of it, in the other case, you're not. Remember the yellow squid I showed you? Well, an experiment that people have done, and you can also do it in a trained monkey, trained to tell you whether it's seeing yellow or not. Right? So you can train a monkey to tell you, I'm seeing right now yellow or I'm not seeing yellow, right? Just like you can see it. And now I can study at the single neuron level with microelectrodes, or in an fMRI, I can put the, magne the ma uh, monkey in a magnet, or the, the undergraduate student in a magnet. And in both cases, I can see where's the difference between when they see blue and when they not see blue. And so this, this will isolate the mechanism that are specifically involved in generating the conscious perception of blue. So it's called the, the neural collate of conscious for blue, or for seeing a German shepherd, or for smelling a flower, or you know, what, whatever, whatever other conscious uh, state you, you're interested in. So this is one of these techniques. It's, it's, it's very widely used. It's, it's a little bit like a magician. Now, he distracts you by sleight of hand and by having a beautiful bikini-clad assistant. We don't have that in the lab. <laughs> uh, we have other things that work very reliable. So, for example, we can do this thing. It's called continuous flash suppression. On the left eye, so I split the image. In your left eye, I show an image of an angry face, a very powerful biological stimulus. In the right eye, I flash these, they're so-called Mondrian, after the Dutch Peter Piet Mondrian. If you keep both eyes open, what you'll see for many, many minutes, you'll only see this. If you blink or you close your right eye, you immediately see the angry face. But if you keep both eyes open, this, because it's high contrast, it's color, and it constantly changes, will totally trump this. Although your left eye sees this, the conscious you will not see this. And so, for instance, you can now, and people have done this, you can now study, uh, just, you know, instead of 
you know, going to a psychoanalyst and paying t a couple of hundred dollars an hour to study your unconscious, I can now study your unconscious in this way because now I can see what are the mechanisms in your brain that respond unconsciously to the angry face or to a happy face. And of course, it turns out there are mechanisms that are specialized to detecting angry people out there. It's obviously biological relevance. Now, the, what's other also biological re re relevant are naked people. <laughs> and so you can do this experiment that has been done by Sheng He. Uh, so you put people in, uh, you, you have subject uh, look at, um, let's see, on the left side here is a naked woman or a naked guy, and here on the right side you take the a naked woman but you cut her up into little squares. I mean, you, you cut the picture of the naked woman into little squares. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so, so they're so-called matched, so you have the overall the same intensity level. In the other eye you put these, these randomly, this, this, these random dots, these Mondrians, right? So now uh, you first of all ask people what they see, and they tell you, well, all I see is these, these flashing lights. You do that for 800 milliseconds, by the way. Or you can also be more objective. You can say, well, tell me, guess, is the naked person, woman or man, is it on the left side or the right side? And people are at chance. So their brain doesn't have access to that information whether the naked person is on the left or on the right. But now well, you can be clever. You can give them a little task. The task is you flash up a little grating here, either on the same side where the naked person was or on the other side, and you ask them to tell you is it, it's either inclined a tad to the right or tad to the left, and you ask them to tell you that. So now they have to focus on this task. And now it turns out you discover that if you look at the people who do it, it depends on their, on their gender and it depends on their sexual orientation. So if they are straight, it turns out that straight men will are much better at this task here if this if this grating is on the side of the invisible nude woman. And they're worse if this grating is on the side of the invisible naked man. <laughs> right? Now, the interesting thing, they, they, uh, they don't see that. So they don't have conscious access because they don't see it consciously. Yet something in the brain uh, picks up the, the gender and, uh, and acts accordingly. And, you know, you get the appropriate behavior. So women, uh, women uh, do better on the, uh, when the grating is on the same side where the invisible naked man is, and gay men, uh, in this case, behave more like straight women do. Anyhow, so it's, it's one of many, many techniques that psychologists have invented to probe the, the unconscious. Now, you can do this uh, also in fMRI, or you can use more sophisticated techniques in, um, in, in animal experiments where you can directly record from the brain, particularly in monkeys that are trained to do this. And so you can, you can look at different parts of the brain and you can ask to what extent are they involved in consciousness. And this is something that Painter already appreciated in the 19th century. You don't see with your eye. In other words, the eye is the receptacle, of course, that's necessary for normal forms of seeing, but you are, and there are many, many reasons uh, uh, for this. You don't, you don't con consciously does not arise at the level of the retina. There are lots and lots of reasons why that's true. More remarkable is it now turns out, that, so this is here a brain, this is the back of the brain, the back of the brain, you can feel there's a little bump. The bump is called primary visual cortex. It's roughly as big as, um, I mean, underneath that bump, it's roughly as big as a credit card. You have one on the left and one on the right. And those, the, uh, the, um, that's a terminus of the optic nerve that goes through an intermediate in the inside of the brain that goes here. It's called the primary visual cortex because that's the first place where visual information goes uh, after it leaves the eyes. It turns out this is not part of the neural correlate either. In fact, part of the research was done here at NYU by David Heger. So this is a little bit more surprising that cortex, that sort of we think of the pinnacle of, of evolution, doesn't seem, at least this part of the brain, doesn't seem to directly give rise to consciousness. And there's good evidence to suggest that none of the primary uh, sensory areas, somatosensory cortex or um, auditory cortex or primary vi uh, visual cortex, give rise to the sense of touch, of hearing, and of, of vision. Cerebellum, this was mentioned before. Now, the cerebellum turned out most of your cells are in the cerebellum. There are 86 billion neurons in the human brain. Of those 86 billion, 80%, 69 billion are in your cerebellum, right? This little brain here below the big guy here, right? This hogs all the limelight. This, in fact, has f uh, three times more neurons or four times more neurons than this. Turns out if you lose this, either you, you never had it in rare cases, a genital, you don't have it, or you lose it due to stroke or cancer or something. Well, you're not going to be a ballet dancer, you're not going to be a rock climber, you have ataxia, your speech is slurred, you look like you're always drunk, but, 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 but you're fully conscious. So it turns out this very large part of the brain, which has 70 billion neurons by itself, it does not seem to be involved in, um, in, in consciousness. So to make a long story short, people are doing this now in great detail, consciousness habitat seems to be not the primary visual area, not the cerebellum, not the retina, but sort of the large-scale, higher-order cortical regions that we have a lot of. 
So our brain is roughly like two pizzas, roughly the, the, the thickness of the dough of pizza, that 13 inch pizzas, two of them, you scrunch them up and put them inside the skull. That's, I mean, that's sort of the geometry of, um, of, of cortex. And the wonder of it all, of course, evolution in mammals, if you look at mouse cortex, if I give you a little grain of mouse cortex and a little grain, like a rice size, a grain of rice size, grain of human cortex, nobody can tell the difference. A few expert neuroanatomists can tell the difference. But the basic substructure is very similar, whether it's a dog brain or mouse brain or monkey brain or human brain. We have more of it, but other animals like whales and dolphins have even more of it. So uh, there's a big mystery there. We, we think we may have the most neurons, but even that isn't clear yet whether that's actually the case. All right, so that's all the neuroscience, and there's endless amount of, 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 of detail one, one, one could talk about here, and the entire specialist conference is dedicated to the neurology of, um, of, um, of consciousness. Now, let's switch. Let's talk about the theory of consciousness, because ultimately we'd like to know a, practically, I'd like to know whether a, a patient, let's say, is conscious or not, like Terry Schiavo, or a fetus, or um, a, a newborn, or a child, or a patient with aphasia. But also, I'd like to know more, uh, more, uh, you know, more fundamentally, is a dog conscious? Now, a dog is very similar to me, evolutionary, behaves a little bit like me, so um, it's easy to answer that question, but what about a squid? You know, we're very distally related to, uh, to squid. What about a bee? You know, a little bee has very complicated behavior, its nervous system is 10 times denser, although much smaller than our brain. Is that conscious? And then, of course, ultimately, you like to know, you know, about, about, thi about things like this here. Um, to what extent are they conscious? So what you really need, you need a theory of conscious that tells you in principle, not just in practice, in principle, what does it take to, for any system do, to, be, to be conscious at all? And so the way to proceed here, because it's difficult, right, the, the, the difference between consciousness and, let's say, studying superstrings or black holes or genes or neurons is, that all those other systems have exterior third, so-called um, third person's property that you can study in the lab, but consciousness also has this internal perspective, right? We don't think it feels like anything to be a black hole or to be an, uh, a gene or a neuron, but, we do, but clearly it feels like something to be me, trust me. Uh, uh, and, and, and so this uh, first person aspect makes it, m m makes it more, a little bit more difficult to study than, than, than these other objects. So you need to start with phenomenology. You need to have a theory that tells you, okay, I, as experienced subject, have certain laws of experience, and uh, uh, I'd like to explain those laws in terms of a fundamental theory, like information theory, is one, one, uh, one candidate. There are po uh, other possible candidates. And then you want the theory, in good old science fashion, to explain a lot of known facts about the neuroscience of consciousness that, that we can now agree on. Right? And, and you have to... Uh, so the, the, there are two flavors of theories. One is sort of fundamentalist theories. The other one are emergent theory. So emergent theory says, well, you know, 10 neurons are unconscious, 302 neurons are unconscious, but, you know, 10,000 neurons are or 100 billion neurons are. So there you have an emergent property. Or you can have a different theory that says consciousness is a fundamental part of the universe, just like charges is a fundamental, you know, properties of elementary particles. And you have quarks that have one third charge and electrons have, 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 have a full charge. And, um, you know, so th those are one flavor of theories of consciousness you can make. The theory that I prefer, that I think the only really candidate uh, theory of consciousness, and I can say that it's not my, because I'm unbiased, not my own theory, is due to Giulio Tononi. He's a psychiatrist, neuroscientist. And uh, he, over the last several years, has constructed a theory of consciousness that, that is A, theoretically, and B, gives rise to nice prediction that actually gives rise to tools, to practical consciousometer that you can use in the clinic or in the lab to test for consciousness in, in people under anesthesia, in people with coma, and possibly in, in, in animals as well. And so it proceeds from two axioms. It says, and these are widely acknowledged by philosophers, in fact, these are usually def by philosophers defined as some of the key elements of consciousness. One is consciousness is incredibly informative. Any one conscious state is highly informative. Even when I wake up, like I did yesterday, at four in the morning in my hotel room, totally bla pitch black, the experience of pitch black makes it uniquely different from any other scene I've ever seen. Imagine every frame of every movie that I've ever watched. Imagine every frame of every movie that will ever be made from now until the end of time. Well, they are all uniquely different from, a, from this particular black scene. So each conscious experience is unique, it's highly, highly informative. Um, uh, because it rules out all these other things. When I'm, when I'm seeing black, I'm not seeing the, 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 the burning t uh, twin towers. I'm not seeing you know, all the other gazillion of things I could see. And it's highly integrated, so consciousness is unitary. Whatever I'm conscious of, I, I apprehend wholly. 
So for example, I'm unable when I see you now as audience, I'm unable to see you in black and white. I cannot not see you in color. It, it comes with it. When I see you as a whole, when I'm conscious of you as a whole, I cannot not see the left half. I mean, I can close my eyes, but, but that's very different. Once I have this, this conscious perception of anything, I apprehend it as, I, as, I apprehend it as a whole. Philosophers uh, refer to this as a unitary nature or the integrated nature of experience. So you want some information theoretical calculus that sort of maximizes both the information as well as the integration. Why information theory? Well, uh, fundamentally, if you are a functionalist, like I think all of us are, in other words, if you don't believe there's something particularly magic about, about, uh, about, the human, uh, about the human brain, then ultimately it can only be the causal nature. I mean, consciousness ultimately has to arise from the causal nature uh, of the interaction among the elements that make, that make up the system, primarily the, um, the brain. And so information theory is one uh, language that's useful to describe that. All right, so um, Julio has, has a theory called integrated information theory where he defines a quantity phi that assigns to any network of causally interacting parts, a simple, you know, abstract, usually it's simple abstract neural networks, or more, uh, more complicated ones like big, small brains or big brains, he can uh, um, uh, assign a number that essentially measures, it's, uh, it's in bits, that measures the synergy, how much integration as well as how much um, um, differentiation. So how much, to what extent is the system more than the sum of the parts, while also being highly informative, because consciousness is, at least in humans, is highly, highly informative. So you want something that's highly integrated and highly informative. So this is sort of a, a visual metaphor. It's difficult to illustrate it. This is sort of a visual metaphor that each of these individual parts, you know, are, are very, um, are very um, informative, but clearly you all know there's something wrong with it since it's, it's not, you know, it's, in, it's, not, it's not integrated. So in terms of um, math, I have a couple of slides of math. So you have a measure here, phi is just uh, effective information, I'll define that in a second, that essentially says you have a system and it transitions in time, right? The system, you have a neural network or brain or an iPhone that transitions from time t minus one to time t, and you're essentially looking at something like the entropy while you're, while you're looking at all possible partitions of the system because the, 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 you want to treat the system as a whole. So you have to ask to what extent is this effective information as a whole or if you cut up, if you, if you have a system of three elements, you make up this cut or this cut or this cut or this possible cut. There are many possible ways you can cut a system. And you want to look at over all those systems and you want to look at the cut that's, that does the worst damage. It's called the minimal information partition in order to compute because you want to know how much integrated information has a system. So you want to cut it in various ways and take them, the minimum integrated system, um, the minimum integrated information over, over all possible cuts. So th the precise measure is fairly st is straightforward. It's uh, essentially the conditional entropy of the individual parts minus conditional entropy of the whole. So you have a partition, right? You have a system that's in state xt, you know, one, some particular distribution of transistors or neurons are on or off um, at time t minus one, given the, sti the, the, the state of system at time t, that's the entire um, um, entropy of the system. And this is the, the conditional entropy of the individual parts where you look at over all possible partition of the system. This is essentially, the experts of you will know this, this is a kullback leibler divergence measure. I don't want to go into it. So you can, in principle, for any system, you can assign a number. Um, so here, for example, you have a system that consists of these eight nodes, they're simple AND gates. In this simple case, it's easy to compute. The MIP is, in this case, the system here is not integrated because you can make this cut and this system is totally isolated from this system. And the entropy of the whole system is essentially just the sum of the entropy of this and the entropy of this. So in this case, there's nothing addition additional above the sum of its two parts. It's exactly that, there's no synergy because the whole system is just the, this system plus this system. So you don't get any, anything additional. But if you look at this system by itself, for instance, the way it's integrated and you have to do the detailed calculus, there are lots of uh, different ways and you have to look at all these different partitions. It turned out this system has a central main complex and it has some measure of integration and the particular number is 2.82. It's not particularly meaningful, it's just it's 42. But it's, it's, um, it's just a number, but it tells you what it tells you, the, uh, sort of, it, it tells you the degree, the, the essentially the size of the of the repertoire of this particular conscious state. So it depends on a particular state. The system is in a particular state xt, and for each state you can compute its 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 its, um, its measure of integration and, and differentiation. And the theory also gives rise to a geometric calculus that exactly predicts the shape of the. So you can think of it where the the sort of the algebra of information is turned into the geometry of experience because you can define an um, informational space 
that essentially um, describes the, the uh, called the qualia uh, um, space, that describes the shape of the experience. And each different state of the system, given its causal interaction, will give rise to unique uh, geometry in this, uh, in this space. So essentially, each of your experiences, ultimately, in this theory, is sort of a, um, uh, this, this, uh, this, um, this geotope, this high-dimensional um, um, polytope in this very, very high-dimensional space. And so uh, the theory would say, ultimately, this is equity, this is the essence of consciousness. It's, it's a mathematical relationship um, 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 among causal elements. And so the mindfulness of the monk or the agony of the cancer pain, uh, pain, patient, those are all different polytopes in this very high dimensional space, and you measure the size of them, the, the size of the conscious repertoire by this number phi. All right. And the, now, how, how can you possibly test this? This all sounds like poetry more than, 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 than science. Well, you can try to make uh, various computations, various predictions. One problem is it's very difficult to compute. Because you have to compute this calculus, you have to look at all possible partitions, and there are many, many partitions. If you have n elements, there are 2 to the n, uh, well, there's a large number of possible partitions called Bell's number, and you can go to Wolfram Alpha, and you can put in Bell's number for 302, the number of neurons in the, in the brain of a C. elegans, and that, in that number, uh, Wolfram Alpha, spits out 10 to the 497. Now, the universe only has 10 to the 80 atoms, so that's a rather large number. And it just tells you that if you wanted to compute it up initio rigorously, you can't do it. There's, there's just no way you do it. So you have to find various approximations to do it. And then you come things like this. So if you have random networks, so with various approximations, for small networks, you can compute it exactly. For large networks, you have to approximate it. So if you do this, you find out that if you just have a random network, this phi is very low. Um, in fact, it's actually very difficult to get networks with high phi. So you, if you have a small network, let's say, of 10 or 12 or 50 nodes or 20 nodes where you can still compute it um, um, uh, fully and analytically, then um, phi is maximized in circuits where you have b uh, sort of a small world connectivity, where you have both local, um, um, local uh, specialization as, as well as functional integration. Those sorts of networks will tend to maximize phi. Um, you, for example, discovered, so this is a brain viewed from below. It's actually a real brain from the Allen Institute where we process them. This is the, the, it's just viewed from below, right? This is the cerebellum, as I mentioned before. And we know the cerebellum is organized in these beautiful anatomical slabs. So it's not really integrated. It's, a it's like a crystal. It's like a neuronal crystal. And it's, it's organized in these slabs, so it's not very integrated. In fact, it's the very opposite of integration, which would nicely explain the fact that if you lose your cerebellum, uh, you have deficits in, in walking and in, in talking, etc., but you don't have, uh, you don't get any deficits in consciousness because its phi is very low. It does not contribute really to the phi of the entire of the brain proper. Now you can do this experiment that uh, Marcelo Massimi has done, who's a collaborator with uh, Tononi. These are not my experiments, where you can measure, f where you have a very simple measure of integration in actual people. Now, what they do here, they get a subject to sleep while he's being shocked with. Uh, uh, called a device called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's just a device that sends, uh, that sends a, a, a brief shock into the brain. Essentially what you're doing, think of it a bell, and you're essentially ringing the bell, and you're listening to the, to the oscillations. So you can, you, can, well, you can do that, you can sort of, while the person is sleeping or while he's awake, sort of essentially, you know, the EM equivalent of just sort of knocking the brain. And then you can do that, for example, when, when you're in deep sleep, uh, sorry, when you're doing in a wake, you can see these nice reverberations. This is, you measure the EG after you do this, you see this nice complex integration, you see, you do it above, um, above the brain here, and then you can see this activity travels to front, travels contralateral, travels back, there's nice integration going on. Now, if you do this in a deep sleep when you're not conscious, there's very little integration. The system, uh, the signal is actually a little bit larger, but it decays very quickly. There's very little, this, the system just remains locally, there's no really integration going on in, in, in sleep. Now, they've also done this now in anesthesia, and anesthesia under this condition looks very similar to the sleeping brain. If you do this in an anesthetized patient, there's very, very little integration going on. More interesting, they've done it in these patients, um, um, in these patients when, um, when, particular, when they're in coma, in persistent vegetative state, when we think there's no consciousness whatsoever, or when, they're, when, they become, uh, when some of them awaken and they transition to minimal conscious state, and a simple index based on this will predict exactly when this happens. So this, so people are now testing it as a possible practical consciousometer. Because as I mentioned, in the, in the world, there are probably 50,000 of these patients. So it's a very real practical clinical problem to test for uh, and for consciousness. 
So now this, this uh, theory doesn't say anything particular about biology. It just talks in general about causal systems and how they interact. So in principle, if this guy has, uh, you know, has high psi, in principle, you, can, you, you should be able to build you know, CPUs or networks that, that the theory predicts that these guys in principle c and, and can also be conscious. So what you need, you need is, um, you know, you need systems that are built that have a high degree of integration as well as, um, as, well as differentiation. And so in principle, this is the wiring diagram of the C elegans, so the roundworm I mentioned at the beginning. These are all the similar two neurons. This is the actual creature. So in principle, you should be able to, in the next five to 10 years, be able to compute phi for things like this, for the mouse brain that I'm studying, 70 million neurons, for the human brain, 86 billion neurons, for the rhomba, uh, for the iPhone 8, it's going to be, it's going to be, this is, by the way, pre-release picture. I got, I got this in a bar in uh, Santa Monica, <laughs> <laughs> where somebody lost it. And, uh, of course, you all know the, the Internet. If you look at the Internet, it's very interesting to me as a biologist, because if you look at the number of nodes, it's on the order of 10 to the 9, and each one has the on the order of 10 to the 9 um, transistors, so that now exceeds the total count of synapses in a human brain. And so the question is, to what extent is this system really integrated? And if it were, it, um, it, um, um, it would be conscious um, at some point in time. So how far we are away from that, who's to say? So lastly, so, so, so the bottom line is a, a way to measure a consciousness by, by this theory says a system's capacity for integrated information can be measured by asking how much information contain, the system contains above that possessed by its individual part. And so you can think of practical ways to test this. And so we, we are visual creatures, and we have immense amount of implicit conscious information when you're looking at any image. You have an enormous amount of information that you, or even a child, a five or six or seven-year-old child, has access to immediately, intuitively, con um, consciously. With, with, without, without elaborate training. So if you build a, so the, the claim is, if you build a computer that understands images at the level we do, you would have, a crea you would have created a system, um, a, a, a conscious machine that has human level, at least uh, con uh, um, the amount of conscience at the, uh, at the level of an average human. So for example, you can, uh, one way to test such a machine, you can ask it, what's wrong with these pictures? So any child, if you see this picture, you all know it's wrong. You all know, because you have visual experience, there's something wrong with the perspective. It's a weird picture. It, it, this is not a real picture. You know this, right? And there are myriads, there are uncountable myriads of manipulation. You can make an image, not just of this type. You can play around with shading. You can play around with color. You can play around with pers perspective and shadows that immediately you know, and a child will know, this is not a right picture. We have no algorithm right now if you just take this sort of picture, of course you can build one algorithm for one particular type of thing that's wrong, right? But you want, you want, you want to have, a, you, a, any human can look at any of these pictures and immediately know they're, they're wrong, right? And so you want to build a machine that, if you have a machine that's conscious, it should be able to pinpoint each one of these cases what's wrong with this, uh, what's wrong with this picture. If we have that, we will have a machine that's conscious. Thank you very much. Yes. So I was wondering, is it necessary to measure the electrical field of the brain in order to get a measure for phi? And if not, what other physical properties could you measure to create that map onto that graphical network? We don't know. So, okay, there, there are several technical questions underneath there. So, A, we don't know to what extent the electric field plays a role. I think it does. It's in generally unappreciated in your science. Right now, the claim is probably that if you measure spiking or not spiking, that's good enough. But we don't know whether to what extent, and that's a very wide belief in the neuroscience community, that as long as you track w which one of the 86 billion neurons is firing currently, that may be good enough. We don't know at this point to what extent subcellular processes, and there is an immense complexity there, molecular processes, regulatory cascade of proteins inside a neuron play a role for this. We just don't know. 
Most people think probably not, but it, they may well be, and then everything will yet increase. I mean, neuroscience is interesting. It's a little bit like um, a cosmology. So each generation of cosmologies recognize the universe is bigger than, you know, by several orders of magnitude than the previous generation, and now they're multiverses. The brain doesn't expand in size, of course, but each new tools in neuroscience re make us realize the brain is even more complex than we thought. So latest tools are these genetic tools that makes us realize there's not just one type of nerve cell, they're not just two types of neurons, excited inhibitory, there are probably a thousand different types of neurons in the brain proper. And it's going to be absolutely essential to recognize which type of neurons is connected to which time other neurons, which immediately gives you a matrix of a million possible types of connection. And so the more we look, the more complexity we see. And most people think the complexity is going to be essential. To model the complexity is going to be essential to finally model a human level um, consciousness. If that's true, the news is sort of bad. It's going to be, take a long, long time before we'll be able to have sort of um, realistic simulations um, of an animal brain, let alone a human brain. Uh, so, uh, a question from here. <laughs> um, so you said that two key essential properties of consciousness are uh, uh, rich information and uh, integrity. So let's take a hologram. It has a lot of information in it, right? And a hologram is integrated so that you can find uh, information about each piece of hologram in like everywhere. So is hologram consciousness or not? If not, what is lacking? Well, so the, the theory says, the theory is neutral on the substrate. The theory, is also, so the, the theory also gives you a number, you know, phi. So you have to compare practically how big is this phi. Let's say you take your brain when you're asleep, deep sleep, you're not conscious, at least your experience is nothing, it's blank. You know, when you're in deep sleep, you don't experience anything. But there's still going to be some connectivity in your brain, we know this. So there's going to be some phi, but that's going to be very low. And then when you wake up, you transition to a huge phi. So it may well be possible that some complex hologram has a phi that's, you know, very small, but that's different from zero. In fact, I would suspect it's, it's different from zero. So in that sense, the theory is more like panpsychism. It's positive to a certain extent that any complex system of interacting part that's more than the sum of the part will have a phi that's different from zero and will have some minimal level of, uh, of consciousness. But you re then you really have to ask about practical consciousness compared to human level consciousness. Hi, uh, my name's Rick, Rick Schwal. Um, this business of uh, detecting what's wrong with this picture, or even that it's a wrong picture, has, has that been done with um, any other species? Have we been able to test that in monkeys or chimpanzees or pigeons or something? Uh, no, it, it, it hasn't been done yet. That's not to say it can't be done. It hasn't, I mean, this was just done uh, last year. It hasn't been done yet. Uh, no, this particular test has not been done, but there are lots of other tests that people have done in, in chimps and, and in pigeons, of course, using vision. You know, pigeons can pick up down, uh, you know, we can do very complicated, sophisticated visual tasks um, uh, from in images that they have never seen before. There's no question if you do these behavioral tests that by all these measures, animals are also conscious. They are not as conscious as we are, but they certainly have all the behavioral repertoire that we tend to associate with, uh, with consciousness. It's not something unique to us. We just have it in a highly developed form. So in the second part of the talk, the types of experiments you were talking about with TMS was looking at whether a person was either unconscious, meaning in a coma or asleep, uh, or fully conscious, and then you got different patterns of activation. However, when you look at the type of unconsciousness that you were talking about in the first half of the talk, in these experiments, when a person is fully awake, and they're either aware of something or not aware, or as you say, unconscious of that thing. This is a different type of unconscious in the fully awake person versus the type you tested with TMS in the second half. Um, and the point that I'd like to make is in those types of experiments, you were looking at a very static type of consciousness. It's either do you see it, uh, a static type of unconscious. You either see it or you don't. Um, a more ecologically valid type of unconscious is that it's much more dynamic, it's motivated, it's emotive. So I'm talking about m the more psychoanalytic type of unconscious where we actively keep things outside of awareness because we're motivated to do so. And that's a bit more rich and complex. Now, theoretically, these things that are kept in the unconscious that are still affecting our behavior are integrated in our neural systems, they're being activated theoretically in a very highly complex way. The idea being is that these unconscious processes that are motivating our behavior will require a lot of integrated information and therefore would theoretically have a high phi. 
yet that will go against Julio's theory, um, saying that anything that has, a, if it has a high enough phi, would be conscious. Yet these things probably, according to your definition, would have a high phi but are unconscious. So the explanation is that the the uh, if you look at it careful, there are many. I mean, we saw this in the talk by Stephen Wolfram. There are many uh, computations that look very, very complex, but actually that follow very simple rules. And so I would posit that the unconscious is not nearly as sophisticated, computationally speaking, as the conscious is. Yes, there are very powerful forces at work. We all know this. But, uh, but that the complexity of the underlying circuits that are involved in unconscious you know, you refer to them as psychoanalytical uh, unconscious, is, is much less, although it gives rise to an apparent rich behavioral repertoire, is much simpler than the complexity of the circuits that give rise to conscious behavior. That would, be, that would be the prediction. Right now we don't know because we can't isolate those in a human, let alone in a, you know, can you do psychoanalysis in a mouse? We don't know. Um, oh, okay. So, you mentioned that self-consciousness isn't necessary for consciousness. Um, I was wondering what you think about just like theories of human self-consciousness, and in particular, if you're familiar with them, uh, self-model theories along the lines of Metzinger or Damasio. Yeah, so, so um, um, Thomas Metzinger and Antonio Damasio, they have made theories about self-consciousness. So clearly self-consciousness is very important for us. There's no question about it. And if you don't have it, you're, you know, you're, you're patient in bad shape. But all I'm saying that in, um, it is not necessary that self-consciousness is just one aspect of our consciousness that we humans particularly treasure, particularly as we get older and as we gain more insight into us and we are more reflective. It is not the general form of consciousness. If you, in your day-to-day -day life, most of the time, you're not worrying about yourself, at least you shouldn't be, um, you're, you, you, you are conscious of, of things outside, you have to do, you are conscious of memory, you have to see things that, that approach you, particularly if you're doing things in a very fast sensory motor loop, like driving, flying, hiking, climbing, dancing, all those sorts of things. That's all I'm saying. It's very important, and there are great theories about self-conscious, and they are important. I'm saying it's, it's, um, it's not necessary for the basic form of consciousness. In evolutionary, it's probably a late addition probably first matter gave, gave, rise, gave rise to consciousness and then only as a proportion of our brain reaches gigantic, gigantic um, sort of development in, in mammals, in particular in us, then uh, out of that arose consciousness reflecting on itself, self-consciousness. But it's evolutionary latecomer. So any theory needs to explain the basic level of consciousness, yes? To maximize the amount of information the system can hold in excess of the sum of its parts, I presume there is an optimal density of networking among the parts and maybe even an optimal uh, configuration of networking. Is this the case? And if so, how closely does the human brain uh, conform to that optimality? I mean, I can't tell you. I think there will be many laws like that. Um, but we just don't know because right now, as I mentioned, it's very computationally very, very difficult to actually compute this measure just because it's, uh, you have to do so many computations. And so even on any conceivable supercomputer, we, we can't do it. We have, to do um, uh, we have to do approximation. It looks like a, a small world connectivity comes in immensely handy. And so there may be, um, so I'm sure there are ways to optimize it. Another related question is very interesting. What is the evolutionary driver for hi-fi? Why should evolution you know, we're, we're children of, of natural selection by evolution, so why, why, why should have evolution cared about phi? So clearly phi must correlate to some intelligence or some adaptive behavior. And so the question you have to ask, what are the, if you look at genetic algorithms, what are the computations that give rise to circuits that have to have high phi um, uh, so that they can be evolutionary drivers to maximize phi in us? If, if that was the evolutionary driver, we don't know. So it's a good question which we can't really answer right now exactly. So just to clarify uh, from your previous, here. right here, to clarify from your previous answer uh, regarding Damasio, the neuronal image maps of the body you're saying are not really needed for consciousness? In normal people, if you don't have the parts that he talks about, you're going to be in very bad shape. Right? In particular, if you don't have the structures of the brain that are involved in generating emotions, you're going to be in bad shape. Right. You, you know, you'll probably be you'll probably be in a hospital. However, that's different from saying that they are that is emotion are essential 
for consciousness. If you look at the patients that have no, at least, strong emotions anymore, they have flat affect, they seem to be otherwise fully conscious of their environment, yet they don't have the usual emotions. You know, my legs are blown off, I, I, I would show some emotions, you know, both in the short and the long term. They don't have them because they lost uh, those parts of the brain. So at least in that sense, emotions are not necessary for, for, conscious, uh, for consciousness. If you didn't have the image map of your leg in your brain, would that make a difference? Yeah, again, it would make a difference because I better know where my leg is, otherwise I'm going to bump in here. And you see that in people who have strokes, one way how their spouses bring them in because, you know, they keep on missing things on the left side. They miss it with their car, they hit the left side of the garage. They keep on bumping in there because they have lost that part of the brain that, that represents that. But they're still conscious. They have lost a particular content. So they have lost the content of the left side of their body or the left side of their visual space. They've lost it due to the stroke. But, but, but they're still conscious, they're still conscious of the right side, they're still conscious of pain or pleasure or other things. So you lose different parts of your brain, you lose specific aspects of consciousness, but you're still conscious of something. And so fundamentally you have to ask, what is it that, that, that makes you conscious of anything at all? And there the claim is it has to do with the complexity of the system. And the, the, the claim is that the cerebral cortex, particularly the human cerebral cortex, is the no, most complex system in the known universe, and it gives rise to a, to a very high phi that's... Uh, that's sort of the claim. Hi. Thanks for a, a very interesting lecture. I wanted to hear your thoughts about two uh, pieces of information. One, uh, Markram, I'm probably, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with him, the head of the IBM Blue Brain Project, if I'm not mistaken. So Markram is claiming that the complete simulation of the human brain is going to be completed by 2021. No comment. No comment. Okay. S okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, second, um, maybe it's another no comment. Uh, we'll see. Hawkins. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, uh, in his book on intelligence, also offers a relatively alluring and relatively simple model of consciousness. Um, any comment? Yeah, so... so um yeah, so Jeff really, fundamentally, I would say, so I'm a good friend of his, I've advised him. Uh, I don't think he has a theory really of consciousness. He thinks consciousness is just going to emerge. You build a system, you make it complex, and somehow it'll be, it'll be, it'll be uh, conscious. It, that's really not a recipe for anyone specific. You know, I need to know a little bit more specific. I mean, uh, this theory, I mean, information theory and consciousness, they go back to the 20s or to the 30s, right? But you want something that tells you very specific. I want a calculus. I want a calculus that tells me which specific wiring gives rise to what type of experience. I want a calculus that explains why is the shape why is the, the experience of taste is uniquely different from the experience of blue? For example, all the colors are on a color circle. Tastes are different, right? So ultimately, that, I need a calculus that tells me about the geometry of those different qualia. And, and at least this theory, at least in principle, give, um, gives you that. While, while, um, um, while, while Jeff Hawkins just believes, you know, you just build it and consciousness will somehow emerge out of it. Because Hawkins basically says that both the feeling of blue and both the taste, for example, are pattern recognition. Yeah, but that's different. We all know you can have, listen, there are great machine vision systems now. For example, this company, um, uh, what's it called, in Israel, that does this fantastic job. You can, you can now buy the little ca their, their, their system, a camera, an integrated ship, that does passenger detection. It's very good at detecting pedestrians. It's really good at detecting pedestrians in real time, right? And, and but, but the system, it does this one thing extremely well, right? So you can, yes, today it's easy to build a pattern detector just for blue or just for red, but that's not consciousness. That's making one distinction, right? When, when, the, when, the, when this pattern system is off, it cannot tell you it's off because it didn't see blue or that it, it, it saw something else. All it can make is the distinction between on or off, right? Between seeing blue and not seeing blue, right? But I can see, when I not see blue, I, there's so many other things I could see. So, so there's vastly more information in a complex system that I have compared to a very simple system. When we think of um, building or analyzing, analyzing a network with a high value of phi, so with potentially some consciousness, how important can be the geometry, the, the dimensional space? So, I mean, a, a two-dimensional network or a three-dimensional network or even higher dimensional network? Well, okay, so there's several interesting points. So, Ultimately, it's based on information theory. So all it talks about is a connectivity matrix. All it cares about are causal interaction. You have nodes, 
neurons, transistors, whatever, optical nodes, building, whatever. You have nodes and they have some causal interaction. And the claim is that, so it's not even about I.O., so it's very different from conventional AI. The, of, of course, it do doesn't say anything about intelligence. It says about experience. It really says the internal causal structure of a system is, uh, the particular causal structure of the system is what gives rise to a particular conscious ex experience of this system. So in principle, you can compute this for building or for anything else. Right now, we lack the tools to do this accurately because we don't have the right mathematics and we don't really fully understand. See, the thing I alluded to before, we don't know in terms of causal interaction to really fully capture human consciousness. Do we need to go to the level of individual molecules? As I said, most people think not right now, but of course, you know, people, you know, we can be mistaken about this, and maybe to capture the fullness of, the co of all the causal interaction of the human brain that gives rise to the immensity of complexity of human consciousness, maybe we need to capture the interaction among all the protein in a cell. Well, there are a thousand different species of proteins inside a single neuron, and of course, there are 10 to the uh, 11 neurons, so now I have to capture all of that too, right? So it makes it computation is very, very, very challenging to do. In order to mimic that, you need a very, very, very complex system. And maybe technology isn't going to be there for a long, long time. Uh, thanks for a great lecture. Just to uh, try to frame it right, if we're asking a computer to understand what's wrong with this image, isn't there a problem with, at that point, ask, asking it to understand human consciousness? In fact, isn't there something about consciousness that is subjective and self-referential in relation to the system? No, according to this self-referential, again, that refers back to self-consciousness. It doesn't have to be self-referential. I mean, that's if you're talking about self-consciousness. Um, yeah, and it, so as, as I said, and we said in the Sunday American article, here we're talking about a human a computer that could mimic human type of, of consciousness as inherent in our understanding of images. It's a very n narrow, particular definition, but the advantage is it's actually a practical definition. You can do this, and, you know, the people are interested in, in, um, uh, in doing this. You know, in principle, in machine vision, I mean, right now, we're very, very far from being able to do this, but in principle, you could get, you know, algorithms that, in principle, um, um, and can do this. So it's a, it's a practical challenge, rather than just a, but it's for one particular, very particular aspect of consciousness. Uh, one last question, maybe. Yes. So has this same what's wrong with this picture test been run on any of the individuals with the sorts of consciousness deficits you were talking about before? No affect, no self-consciousness, and do they report the same sense? Uh, that no, I mean, not the, no, not this, this particular, I mean, it depends on what type of patient you have. You can imagine some people with agnosia, for example, they're unable to recognize uh, objects. So they couldn't, or, you know, with postbagnose, they wouldn't know that that's a, you know, they might not know it's a face or, or something like that. So really, you have to look at which specific um, a patient. But certainly for normal, certainly if you do it in you and me and, you know, in our children, this is a fairly straightforward test. And, you know, every, you know most of us should be able, not all, but most of us should be able to, to pass this, uh, this sort of test. All right, thank you much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Koch. Um, we are headed to a break.